Hey, Alex Williams of the New Stack here with Joshua Long. Good to see you, Josh. Hi again. Hey, last time we, yeah, last time we talked, uh, you showed us uh, Spring Boot, and now today, logically, you're going to show us Spring Cloud, which is you know, essentially built on top of Spring Boot. So, yes, it is. Yeah, and so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and and you know what you're doing, and then we'll get right into a demo. Well, all right. My name is Josh Long. I'm a pr principal technology advocate on the uh, advocacy team at Pivotal, and uh, I do my best in my in my day to day to help organizations and customers uh, and the community sort of better move to this uh, microservices world, this cloud native world. And a a big part of that is that a big part of that is their need to go faster, to deliver safely and quickly and consistently software to production. And when we last talked, I showed. Spring Boot, which makes short work of the uh, tedious wiki page with 100 items that you must do to stand up a new service uh, before you can move it to production. Getting rid of that friction, that thing that slows down our move to production, is very important. But once you've stood up a lot of microservices, there's a, uh, and, you know, these things are independently deployable. They're supposed to be separate processes deployed at separate times, one not dependent on the other. Once you've done that, you're now very, very squarely in the uh, in the camp of distributed systems, and that invites complexity, right? And so, those that complexity is what we're going to look at today: is how to reduce that complexity associated uh, with service-to-service uh, -service calls and so on. I've got the same kind of code as we had last time. This is a our, our simple, you know, straw man REST API. Um, if you stand it up like so, it'll give us a just a little bit of data from this, from our sample. We've inserted some sample records into the database here, uh, and that's now available as a REST service, which I can talk to here. Localhost 8080 reservations. So there's our, our simple uh, uh, payload with all the results and finder methods and hypermedia and so on. Uh, if I'm standing up more than a few services, I'm going to need to address common patterns, you know, these non-functional requirements that are implied with uh, distributed systems. One of them is centralized configuration. So Spring Boot makes short work of taking care of 12-factor style configuration. How do I externalize that which changes from one environment to another from the build itself? How do I promote one binary and simply reconfigure it when I move it to different environments? 12-factor style configuration, you know, would have you uh, externalize that information um, and you know hopefully the hosts the passwords the locators the credentials all those things that change from one environment to another <coughs> are administered outside of the actual code but when you start to have more than one service that becomes tedious you know do you have to restart processes just to change passwords and, mm -hmm. and uh, host names you have to visit each node I mean a lot of that is mitigated uh, by for example like a, a cloud platform right something like a cloud foundry which makes short work of starting and stopping services, but even still, there's, a, there's complexity there. And also discipline is required. For example, how do you do symmetric encryption and decryption of at rest passwords in, in property files, for example, or in shell scripts and environment variables? So all of this is, you know, all of this is, a, it requires something more. Another use case is, how do you do live reloading of data? How do I do feature flags, that kind of thing, right? Sort of restarting a process. How do I change the configuration? So what we're going to look at first is a, the Spring Cloud Config Service, which is a microservice that you can stand up that sits in front of a repository of configuration files. In this case, I've got a directory managed through uh, managed by Git, uh, the, the uh, version control system, on my desktop. It's in the uh, desktop forward slash config folder. And here you can see I've got any number of, um, of uh, property files. I'm going to do git pull git reset hard, git clean minus id, uh, and the uh, clean. And now if I look at that, you know, I should have a, a, a sort of a, work, a clean working copy of all the config there. What I want to do is I want to have this microservice talk to that repository and then stand up, you know, you know retrofit this reservation service to talk to that uh, configuration microservice so it can draw its configuration from a single place. If I want to change it, I need only change the configuration in the repository, which is after all journaled and, and uh, auditable because it's Git. And then I can 
propagate those changes to my services. So if we look at the configuration in the, um, in the, in the directory here, if we look at, for example, reservation service.properties, uh, you can see we've got a message here, which is um, from the Cloud Foundry Summit that I was just at in, in Shanghai a few days ago. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I've got a server.port value. Server.port is what the, is the port I want to run a service on. In this case, the service is reservation hyphen service, and thus it's going to get the information in reservation hyphen service dot properties. Indeed, it'll get this and more. If I, if I want to see what, I can go to the, uh, the browser here, and here's the same information. Here's the config service that we've already got running, right? And, and it's pretty easy to stand up your own if you go to start.spring.io and uh, choose the config server. If you're using a platform like Cloud Foundry, this is just a backing service that you can easily uh, create and then bind. So it's running, I've already pointed it to this desktop repository. And you can see here, it's got two files, two sets of configuration, reservation service properties, which any microservice identifying itself as reservation service would see, and then application properties, which only, you know, which all services, regardless of their name, will see. So. Uh, should there be a conflict, as there is here, between server.port and the more specifically named reservation service.properties and server.port down here and application.properties, the more specifically file, uh, more specifically named file, the, the property in that file wins. So we're going to retrofit our reservation service and we're going to also inject this message here. So let's go back here and I'm going to go to the client and I'll add the dependency that lets me talk to the config server. So I'm going to add a bit of indirection, but that's okay because it gives me the ability now to uh, centralize version, journal, audit, etc. all this configuration. Once I've done this, I need to tell my code where to go to get its configuration. By default, Spring Boot projects look for uh, configuration in application.properties or application.yaml in the uh, resources directory. I'm going to tell it instead uh, to talk to the config service, which is running on another port. So I'll say that it's, I'll give it a name, it's called reservation service, and then I'll specify that it has to live, or look rather in uh, localhost 8888. Naturally, this itself could have been in an environment variable, right? So nothing has to be hard coded. This could have been a dash D argument or, or an environment variable. Uh, so that's there. I'm also gonna rename this property because now, since I'm drawing my configuration from the config service, there's no need for the framework to find a, a configuration from the local inbuilt compiled in property file. Instead, I'll rename it to something called bootstrap.properties, which is read by Spring Boot when the application starts up, uh, not naturally and necessarily at an earlier phase. Uh, and then in my code, I'll simply create a, a, a REST controller that just parrots the message uh, that we had from that, that REST service. I'm gonna say REST controller or message REST controller. I'll inject the key, which is the, the message key, and stand up an endpoint to show that key. Now, I also want to be able to reload this value live when the application is uh, running, so I'm going to also annotate this bean with at refresh scope, uh, and then restart. And we should, if everything goes to plan, be able to access forward slash message and get the key from the config server. And it should also, in lieu of starting up on port 8080, which is the default, it should start up on port um, 8000, because that's what we had configured in the config server. So let's see, localhost 8000 forward slash reservations, that should work, yep, check, message. There's that value. Now that value is there go. not really, it's, it's, it's a good value. I think you can agree it's, I worked hard on it. It's got one, two, three, four, five words. So that's, that's something, but mm. as, as values go, we can do better. I think so. <clears throat> I'm going to open up this value here and I'll say, um, oh. right. Mm. I'm going to make it a much better value. Now, of course, notice that I added exclamation marks so as to make my opinion uh, uh, more valid in the context of Reddit. So here we go. Now I'm going to commit the change to that property file, uh, like so. And if I go to the config server here, the microservice that guards our configuration, I can see that it's immediately aware of the old value, of the new value, rather. But I haven't 
seeing that value updated here. It's still cached and showing the old value. So I can now trigger externally a uh, reconfiguration, a refresh by doing an empty post like this. I'm saying empty post to localhost 8000 forward slash refresh. Once I do that, it, it immediately reflects the change in the code without having to restart the process. This gives me the ability to centrally change, you know, administer, update, and, and then federate changes across all my services very simply. Uh, when you move to distributed computing, another very common requirement is service registration and discovery. The reason we care about that is because we want our services to be uh, decoupled from hosts and ports, right? One, uh, one approach might be to use DNS, but DNS is not a very good idea in a very in a sufficiently distributed system because it sits in front, typically, it sits in front of a load balancer, which then sits in front of an ensemble of microservices. If one of those is sick, there's no way to understand, to ascertain that uh, by talking to DNS. There's no way to ask questions about the state of the cluster. Uh, is there a service available? Can I talk to it? Is it down, etc. I'd much rather- does, does this speak to the importance of you know, essentially instrumenting your systems to some degree so you have a good understanding of, of your overall environment? Yeah, well, what we want to do is we want to have our services volunteer where they are and then make the, that'll make them discoverable to other services. And the way they can volunteer is by uh, putting their names in a, in a phone book, so to speak, a service registry. Mm -hmm. um, Spring Cloud supports many different kinds of service registries, but we're going to look at Netflix's Eureka, which is running here on another node. I have no services as yet registered in Eureka, but what I'd like to do is to now make it so that um, when I revisit my reservation service, I'll add support for talking to Eureka here. And I'll opt in for that. I'll, I'll say that I want to take advantage of service registration and discovery by using the discovery client abstraction there. And then I'll restart. And that should give me now a service that is discoverable via a service ID. Uh, and because it's because everything is being done through the service registry, which by the by, you should always stand up in a highly available configuration, at least three instances. I'm not doing that here because this is a local host demo. That's why we had that big red error message on the, uh, on the console there. Um, by, by standing it up and making it as making it something that's available on my, um, in my registry, other services can now, talk to the registry to the API. Right now we're looking at a meet space API, but there's actually a REST API here for, for clients. And you can see our service is now registered in Eureka, reservation service. It's up. There's only one instance of it. It's on this host, this service ID, and this port. And um, to sort of demonstrate that in action, we can stand up a, a, another service. I'm going to create a kind of a very simple edge service here. So I'll use the config client. I'll use Eureka's discovery support here. I'll use web support actuator as well, um, and so on. Here we go. And this is an edge service. Now, if you look at what a lot of organizations do is they have a, a, a suite of microservices. These microservices talk one to another, uh, albeit through the registry sometimes. Um, but when it comes to outside clients, iPhones, PlayStations, you know, Tesla's, uh, HTML5 desktop applications, browser applications, rather, uh, all that stuff is is not going to talk via the registry. They're going to talk to something exposed to via DNS, probably secured, etc. And uh, each client is different, as you know. These things can be uh, very, very different in form and function. So security might be different. How you, you know, the kinds of payloads and protocols they speak may be different. Uh, so what, what most organizations we see do is they stand up an edge service, something that stands as an intermediary between the HTML5 clients, for example, and the back-end suite of services. Indeed, uh, an organization like Netflix will do one edge service per client. They'll have an HTML5 edge service. They'll have a you know a Roku edge service, et cetera. Uh, and this is a logical place to put security, to put authentication, to do API or protocol translations, something like an API gateway or a micro proxy, mm -hmm. et cetera. <laughs> so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just build a simple straw man edge service uh, and I'm going to set up a micro proxy, right? I want this micro proxy uh, to uh, simply um, proxy all my services and make them available so that I can access them from the same host and port. And if you're building a, um, if you're building a 
uh, HTML5 client, for example, maybe that's enough, right? I mean, you can, uh, you just need to be able to get all the services from the same host and port and uh, maybe add to HTTP basic or OAuth and uh, terminate this service at SSL. And maybe that's enough. Maybe you're done. So I'm going to tell this service that it should take part in service registration discovery so that it can talk to the registry. And I'm also going to say that it's a, a Zool proxy. This is a micro proxy that will forward requests to the services as registered in the registry. I'll use, uh, I'll rename the file bootstrap the properties and uh, point it at my uh, registry. And I'm uh, sorry, it's the config service. I gave it a name as well. So I'll say Spring Cloud Config UI equals HTTP localhost 8888. And so now I've told it to talk to, to Eureka, which we have running, and that configuration is in the config server, which we've just looked at. And I've told it that it's to make all of the services that are registered in the registry which again, it'll discover through the configuration, uh, available under a single sort of proxied host and port. If I start that up, um, we'll see it's been up on port 9999. Okay, local host. So here we go. Here's my sort of endpoint here, reservation hyphen service forward slash reservation. So if you You'll recall our reservation service lives in port 8000, right? Here it is, here's, here's the old one. So let's see the new one, port 8000. This is our actual service. And yet if I go to 9999 forward slash reservation hyphen service, that's the service ID as we found it registered here in Eureka. If I go to that endpoint and then address any of the content, any of the paths underneath the, the root there. So this is reservations, that was forward slash reservations. I get the same information. And if I have 10 instances of this service, whatever the service is, foo, if it's foo service or bar service, you know, whatever, if I have more than one instance in the registry, this will automatically be load balanced using something called Netflix Ribbon, which is a client-side load balancer. The beauty of that is that I can make decisions about how to route requests mm. from the client to the node um, on the client. I can version control it. I can unit test it. I can make something more interesting than just your standard checkbox doing Rand robin load balancing. Uh, and so there's a lot of other stuff you could do here. You could, you could build an API gateway that uses our REST client to talk to that service and then automatically get client-side load balancing as well. You could do single sign-on using Spring Cloud Security to protect REST resources. Uh, you could instrument this stuff to, do distributed, to participate in distributed tracing so that everything shows up in something like Twitter Zipkin, right? Uh, so you could, you could do waterfall graphs of, of, of hops from one service to another, to another, to another, to another. Um, all of that is easy to see in a single dashboard using Spring Cloud Zipkin, right? So there's a lot, a lot of stuff here. Uh, if you want to do pub sub or event driven um, system composition instead of REST based composition, you can use Spring Cloud Stream. Um, a lot of stuff here, right? And this is, these are sort of part and parcel of building distributed systems. A lot of the high performance organizations that have had to scale and had to go quickly, they've discovered these patterns. And so Spring Cloud just commoditizes these patterns, integrates them, pulls them together, and makes them work for you. Uh, there's a very rich you know, suite of stuff here. And a lot of organizations like Alibaba, like Netflix, like uh, Baidu, like Ticketmaster, they're looking at this stuff and they're thinking, well, gee, we can rebase on top of this. There's no need to maintain all that extra layer of code on top of Spring that we had to maintain before. So Josh, thank you very much for providing a demo of Spring Cloud. And it follows well with your demo earlier that we saw of Spring Boot. And so now we get a full picture of how Spring Boot and Spring Cloud work together. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, as usual, always a pleasure. Great. All right, well, have a great year, and we'll talk soon. Cheers.